Yeah. All right. We are back. We are back. Just want to make sure everybody is coming in. We are back. All right. Welcome back, Chris. Bro, I don't know what went on there. But it seems like for what, three to four minutes I was talking to myself. <laughs> oh, Lord. So you all need to tell me what's the last thing that you heard. So I know where to take it. Where are we actually taking it from? Yeah, so just let me know what's the last thing that you heard. So I'll know where to take it from. This Facebook thing is ridiculous, you know. All right, so Cheryl is back. Sherry is back. Awesome, I am back. I don't know what went on there just now. <laughs> All right, all right, we are back. Okay, so I may have been speaking to myself. Priscilla is back, great. I may have been speaking to myself for about three to four minutes. <laughs> all right, so I would like you all to let, let, let me know what was the last thing that you all heard. Just please let me know what's the last thing that you did. What was the last thing that you did? Just let, just let me know in the chat window. I actually missed the last five minutes but I took my dog out. Okay, okay. All right, understood. Um, all right, so what's the last thing everybody else did? I put it in the chat window. Let me just see what's the last thing that you did. So I know where to take up where 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 we taking that up from. Temptation two. Okay. All right. All right. Lovely. All right. So temptation one was not using food as a reference point. I have no flesh and to walk. See and think on the perspective of God. Rabbi told him, right, okay, awesome. Right, so the reason why the reason why Jesus they realize that all four gospels they actually pretty much telling the same story is because the disciples' responsibility was to memorize everything that the rabbi taught. Everything that he said that comes out of his mouth, they memorize it. Right? So the temptations of the wilderness was actually a teaching tool, as I was saying. So you read the temptations in the wilderness. It's not because these guys actually, Jesus said he was in the wilderness. No. These guys only teach, only wrote what they were actually, some of them actually wrote the experience, but these guys actually wrote, wrote the teachings, the teaching tools. So the wilderness experience was actually a teaching tool that Jesus used. And that is why, because he uses it as a, as a teaching tool, this is why he rebukes them regularly. Because the three things mentioned in the wilderness is food, money, and spiritual manifestation. Yeah, is everybody seeing me and, and hearing me? Just, 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 just give me an indication in the chat window there, please. If you're seeing and hearing me, just give me an indication in the chat window. Just want to make sure I'm, lost, I'm not lost again talking and, 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 and nobody's actually hearing me. 
right? So why is he doing that? All right, okay, I'm seeing the hearts. All right, lovely, lovely. All right, so in other words, Jesus actually highlighted three things. Now, Jesus actually taught that to make God your reference point. He taught that. Make God your reference point. So basically what Jesus is actually saying. Great. All right. Thank you, Sherry and Sherry. So in other words, what Jesus was teaching was discipline feet. This was the message. Discipline feet in your identity. I say again, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. He uses it as a teaching tool to show dis discipline, faith, and identity. So in other words, if you put it in modern English, what Jesus was actually saying is, you're going to be tempted by a lack of food. Now, all brothers and sisters, all holy siblings in Christ, go through the same temptation. It is because that is part of your actual learning how to work out discipline in your identity. Right? Priscilla, I, I, I hope you're following what I'm saying here. It is actually teaching to, to teach you not to not be tempted by Satan. No. That has nothing to do with temptation by Satan. Yes, it is a temptation, but the purpose of the, of the teaching of teaching the temptation is actually to get to the point of understanding that the power, everything in God, flows from your discipline, faith in your identification as God. This is why Satan, Satan starts the temptation if you are the son of God. Because to be a son of God is to be God, as written in, as is written in Psalm 82. That ye are gods, all of you are sons of the Most High. There's a couplet. Gods there and sons are couplets. So the sons are gods. The, son, the sons are gods. Jesus, if you notice, when Jesus went into the wilderness, it says that Jesus went into the wilderness filled with the Holy Ghost. But after the temptation that actually was about, if you are the Son of God, do this. He came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Therefore, it is very evident just by the temptation, apart from what I explained in the Old Testament, that, the, that one could be filled with the Spirit and never walk out the power because they identify themselves by an identity that is not God. To walk out the power of the Spirit, you have to identify and train yourself by discipline to keep your identity as God. Is this, is this making sense, Priscilla? Just type in the chat room there for me, please. I just want to make sure that you're following and everybody else here is following. The temptation is, if you are the Son of God, now, according to Psalm 82, if you are Son of God, you are a God. Therefore, Jesus went into the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit as carpenter Jesus. But when Jesus came out of the wilderness, he came out of the wilderness, Holy Spirit. He came out of the wilderness, Yahweh. He came out of the wilderness in the identity of God, of Yahweh. Great. Lovely. So what he was actually teaching, that there are three things that are going to come up in your life that is going to cause you to question. I'm just putting this in modern English. Three things that are going to come up in life that is actually going to cause you to question your identity. Number one is a lack of food. Now, everyone here on this call can say that at some point in time in their Christian life, I shouldn't say Christian because let's say saint, in their life as a son of God, everyone here in the life of the son of God have actually faced situations where food may be, may be a bit scarce. Everybody here could say the same thing. That's because that's part of, of, your, of your walk in Christ, learning to be disciplined in faith in presence of a lack of food. The second is money, a lack of money. Jesus actually used that as a teaching tool to teach disciples. When you see a lack of money, the temptation is going to come to not 
to actually question your identity and to, to, to change your reference point, to make it money, to get money. What Jesus is actually showing is make God your reference point and the money will follow you. If you make the money the reference point, you'll make money the God. That is why when, he, when Satan actually said, I will give you all of this, he said that he serves only one God. I know these things are not taught, but it is extremely scriptural. There is no exaggeration here. I'm not making this up. This is the culture. You have to study the culture of the people to understand the scripture in its, in, its, in its context. And the third thing that he says that will cause, I'm just putting this in modern English, the third thing that he's identifying that will cause you to question and to actually to question your identity and to, to actually be tempted to not have faith in your identity as God is not seeing spiritual manifestation. That is the temptation. That's what the temptation is about. Throw yourself down and the angels, what he's actually saying, what he's actually telling them by teaching them that as a, using that as a, as a teaching tool that you are going to face situations where you're not going to see the spiritual manifestation. Maintain faith in your identity. It is for this reason that Jesus met them at the bottom of the hill after the transfiguration and told them that you're actually, and, and realized that they couldn't get the devil out of the man. And when he asked them, what's the problem? When they asked him, what's the problem? He said, because of your unbelief in your identity. In other words, your unbelief in your identity as me. In other words, what Jesus is actually saying is, he rebuked them because what they would have been doing is that when they didn't see the devil come out immediately, they began to question. They used that as a reference point for the power. And Jesus taught them that seeing manifestation is not the reference point for the power. The reference point for the power is your identity as the Spirit of God, as Him, as Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus wasn't operating on the identity as the carpenter. He was operating on the identity as the Spirit of God. This is why he says, throw down this temple. Because the temple is the place where God lives. The temple is the place where God lives. I say that again. So if he's saying, I, um, throw down this temple, he's identifying himself as the Spirit of Yahweh. Is this making sense? If you, this is making sense, type Spirit of God. Type it there for me before I move on. Yes, Cheryl, unwavering faith in any identity is, is key. So much that when they actually started to waver and started to use the manifestation as a reference point the power stopped and he rebuking them he's rebuking them regularly because he's telling them these things are going to come up three things are going to come up at you that is actually going to cause you to question and to, to cause you to, to to tempt you to not believe in who you are as the spirit of god and they continually were disobeying when the things came up, they continually fall into it and he's telling them, you're a wicked and perverse generation. Great. Right, right. So our walking, because of our growth, our becoming one and one with God, with his mind and perspective, the willingness. What? Repeat that. Um, our walking equals our growth. Our, because our becoming one with God, with his mind and perspective, equals the wilderness. Technically, yes. Technically, yes. Right? This is the same thing that the children of Israel went, in, went through in the wilderness experience. See, in, in, this case, in this case, I wouldn't say that you're going through a wilderness because Christ Jesus has already went through the wilderness for you. Listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you here. You are not going through a wilderness experience. 
because Christ Jesus went through the wilderness for you. That whole doctrine that you're going through the wilderness is a bunch of folly too. It has nothing to do with scripture. Jesus never said that you will go through the wilderness. The reason why you would never go through the wilderness is because Jesus went through the wilderness for you. The reason why Jesus went through the wilderness for you is because man was failing. Israel failed in the wilderness. Jesus was born as the nation of Israel, as, in, as Israel as a person, and went and actually passed the wilderness test. No saint on the face of the planet, nobody in Christ is going through wilderness. What you're going through is discipline. That is not wilderness. Does that make sense? Hey, Laurie! <laughs> Holy sister, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to see you. It's always a pleasure to see you. I'm actually catching glimpses of, of the awakening in Australia. How is it going for you? Awesome, awesome. All right, so everybody is following. So what I'm, what, so what I'm saying is, as, a, as an individual in Christ, that, that is another religious bubble, religious foolishness, this religious nonsense that you're going through the wilderness. That's a lie. The reason why Jesus came as Israel to actually go, and go through the wilderness experience is because Israel as a nation failed in the wilderness through Moses. So Jesus came to relive their history to actually walk out the wilderness pass the tests in the wilderness, meaning he actually went through these three things in the wilderness that actually are the temptations that every saint faces. And listen to what I'm telling you. Eh? You are not going to actually begin to see manifestation. I'm actually saying this from experience also. You are not going to begin to see the manifestations that you're looking for, the power and the manifestation of God that you're looking for until you actually stop using what you see as your reference point. You ref the power flows from using your the Holy Spirit as a reference point of your identity. Where you are actually lacking food, you may, you may, go, you may go hungry. It is, it is there for the purpose. That there, you're going to go through it because Father is disciplining you. Hebrews 12. He explains that to you. He is disciplining you. In other words, you are born in Christ as full-grown Jesus. So you don't have to go to the wilderness anymore. Your brain, your brain is the immature part of, of your construct. And Father is actually, is actually using, well, he is not tempting you. You're actually going to go through these things so that you can discipline your brain, which is your child, to be disciplined, to be fixed in faith, in, in using the Holy Spirit as reference point for your identity. So every son of God is going to go through situations where there's a lack of food. It's an opportunity for you to learn to discipline your faith in who you are, Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit. You're going to go through a lack of money. You see, you're going through the, the, the discipline. And the discipline, the, the, the session of discipline is, is taking place for you to learn to, to settle your mind in disciplined faith in your identity as Christ Jesus and your identity as God. And the more you use the, the money as your reference point, the more you are rejecting the discipline of the Holy Spirit. And you're not going to get anywhere because the power flows from disciplined faith in yourself as God. I'm being, I'm being very blunt. This is amazing. Not like I thought, though. When you see discipline, do you mean punishment or learning? No, you're not being punished. It is not punishment. James actually explains that temptation is only temptation to you because 
of your own personal indiscipline. If you are if you are normally disciplined in your faith, nothing will tempt you. You will be at peace. Simple. The reason why you're actually not seeing physic, um, physical power, not, and when I say physical power, the supernatural power of God flowing through you in the way you would like, is because of exactly what Jesus taught through the willingness, through the willingness teaching that they memorized. That you actually have to keep perfect, not perfect, but strict, disciplined faith in your identity as the Holy Spirit of God. I say again, strict discipline faith in your identity as the Holy Spirit of God. So if so to actually the um the things that are going to come up in life is a lack of food, a lack of money, and a lack of physical physical manifestation, supernatural manifestation. These things are going to happen um, when these things happen, it is actually your opportunity to buckle down and to discipline yourself. That in even in the absence of food, of money, or of spiritual manifestation, like not seeing healing when you lay hands, not seeing sickness leave people when you pray, that there are opportunities for you to sit to, to, to remember what Jesus taught, that discipline faith and buckle down and maintain your discipline as the Holy Spirit. The, the teaching also teaches, uh, as I said, when Jesus went into the wilderness, he went in filled with the Holy Spirit. He went in filled with the Holy Spirit, but was not walking in the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit came when Jesus released his whole identity as carpenter Jesus and identified himself as the Holy Spirit of God. When he actually maintained discipline in his identity, he walked out in the wilderness in the power of God. Go and check it in Luke. He went in filled and walked out in the power. Discipline is drastic change to the truth and faith. Discipline is drastic change to the truth. Right. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Right? So, he went in the wilderness, which means that until you begin to discipline your faith, you'll be filled with the Spirit and not see the power that you're looking for. But when these things are not, this, these things are no big magic Mathematics. I am. I am. I'm. I'm not only speaking because I've studied it, but I've, I can actually teach it and walk anybody into it because it's something that I've been experiencing. It's something that we have seen. As a matter of fact, I'll give you. I'll give. I'll give you an example. When we actually, when I say we here, I'm actually referring to Kelly and myself. When we actually realize what we were going through because we were going through some some difficult things um where we actually faced some some financial lack some financial difficulties and even times within this period of time where because of the financial difficulties food was not as in abundance as it was as, as it should have been and Then she had her son, Maxino, who actually suffered seizures. And we actually had to be hospitalized. When we actually understood what was taking place, it, the, the change was dramatic. So, so dramatic. But look at this. Before we, while we were studying and before, the, before Father actually guided us to the understanding of it, this thing is extremely mechanical. It is extremely mechanical. I'm not, I am not exaggerating. This is extremely mechanical. We had spent a lot of time, actually, you know, with the experiment that we were doing. We would actually study and then put it to the test. So what we would do is actually, we literally had practice sessions. 
killing myself and those who would have been studying with us. We had practice sessions. Um, the practice sessions was when we study, we would actually practice by speaking to each other's body and we and actually grow each other's hands or grow, grow each other's fingers. Give the, the body's commands and watch it take place. There were time there was a there was a time, there were times in the earlies where we would see a manifestation and then another time we not seen any manifestation. About two to three weeks, about a month, about a month, a month and a half passed, and this thing back and forth, and we couldn't understand why is it not consistent. When we understand now, within that period of time, listen very carefully to what took place in. When that and I said, and I'm saying this to actually emphasize, it is your strict discipline in your in faith in your identity as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, was where the power flows. Um, throughout that period of time, we had many sessions where I would command her hair to grow, and we, we watch it. We're not seeing any kind of reaction. We give it a day or two, three days, four days, a week. We're not seeing anything. She wanted to actually put on, she actually also wanted to, um, to put on a little weight. So I speak to her body. We ain't seen any kind of massive results. The calling out her limbs and so on, it's happening once in a while. When we actually understood that what this is about, we actually, what Jesus was actually teaching. And we understood that all the Psalms is about trust in God, which is the same thing Jesus teaching. Trust. But discipline trust. Using the negative experiences, the lack of food, the lack of finances, as well as what took place with her son, as opportunity to train ourselves to not use it as a reference point, but to make a conscientious decision in the difficulty to make the Spirit of God the reference point for the identity. When we understood that, Father actually used a vision to actually seal it down for me. And this is what he, this is what he showed me. He showed me as a plant, a green plant in the middle of a big field that had no grass. This is when we, we, were, we were facing the, we were facing some. It was actually, it was actually strong difficulty, right? And we couldn't understand why. He showed me myself as a green tree, a green plant, about waist high, in the middle of a field that had no grass, brown, but the brown dirt looked rich. It was rich brown dirt. It wasn't dry. And I heard him say, a plant needs water and sunlight to grow. But what I want you to do is to do not depend on the water or the sunlight to grow. Just like that plant, I want you to sit alone and make me your reference point. Grow because make me your reference point. Know that you will grow because of me, not because of the water and not because of the sunlight. Around the same time, we, we began to understand what the context of Jesus' teachings was. The context was these three areas are areas that are going to come up. It is areas where you take the opportunity to make a conscientious decision to keep, to keep discipline in your faith. So don't use it and begin to waver because you're going through some difficulty. Use it as an opportunity to discipline your faith in your identity as Christ, as Christ Jesus and your identity as the Holy Spirit. When we identified that, I am telling you this, within the same day that we identified it, the same day we made a decision when we realized what the thing was and, and what the, 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 the teaching was and what the scriptures 
in the Sam's world. I went and I actually took out about 30 verses of scripture concerning trust. And I literally said, to both of us, we actually made the decision, this, if this is it, we are going to make this a mechanical and a conscientious decision. We made the decision and to renew the mind, we took out scriptures in the Bible concerning trust. And every three hours, we would stop wherever we are in the day, call each other, and, and, and actually read 10 verses. And actually imagine you actually obeying the, the 10 verses, like trusting the Lord in this and trusting the Lord in that. Now, listen to what I'm telling you. When we did that, what I'm telling you here, I'm not, I don't really explain in public. When we did that, the moment we began to renew our minds, the same day we got on the understanding, the second day when we began the routine to renew the mind, I'm telling you, within the same day, we did not have any practical exercises. Within the same day, Kelly's hair began to grow, her legs began to respond to the command that was spoken a month ago. It was as if the key, the secret was to discipline your faith, no matter what you see. And I'm saying that commands that were given were at a standstill for a month and a half, for five to six weeks. And the moment we actually made the decision and took a drastic approach to conscientiously and purposefully trust God, all of the commands that were spoken five to six weeks ago started to hit her like a storm. It was as though the commands were there waiting. And as soon as we line up the trust, line up the discipline faith, everything started to happen. And she was shocked. She wanted to know how is that possible. And then we realized we spoke those things six weeks and nothing was happening because the power to accomplish what you speak and what you want comes from disciplined feet in your identity as the Holy Spirit. Is this making sense? Is this making sense? If this is making sense, type it in, type, type spirit in the chat room. I'm going to show you one thing before we before we wrap this up because we could stay here for the next three hours. You know that, <laughs> right? But I, I I want to show you something in scriptures, right? So I just want to mention ah the fourth thing. So he mentioned three things that is actually going to you're going to be facing that you that you actually sh should use as an opportunity to maintain discipline in your faith as the Holy Spirit. Food, a lack of food. Two, a lack of money. It is not that Satan is doing you anything. It is an opportunity for you to make the conscientious decision. You don't realize that Father disciplining you shows that he loves you a heck of a lot. You know? Because if he doesn't do that, the power will never flow through you. It is the it is it is it is the it his discipline is the way it is the only way for you to flow for the power to flow through you. It is the only way. He is not doing you evil. He is trying to get you to become who you are. The third thing was now is the, the third thing is something that is plaguing the body of Christ right now because they don't know what I just explained to you. A lot of people walking around laying hands and when they don't see the results, they allow it to define them. They, they, they allow the, the results to validate them. And Jesus actually showed in, his, in, in the teaching of his wilderness experience that the Holy Spirit validates you. Not food, not money, and not supernatural manifestation. 
I cannot see that clearer than that. It is as blunt as I can see it. If you're using physical manifestation as a reference point to feel validated, you're cutting off the power. In a, so you actually, um, you actually, it, in, in other words, he's teaching your validation doesn't come from people. It does not come from food, how much food that you have. It does not come from how much money that you have. And then it does not come from the supernatural manifestation of the things that you're praying for. It comes from strict discipline in your identity. The fourth thing that he, that he taught the disciples later on in the Gospels, you have to read it to find it, is persecution. And when they're going through it, it is very easy for them to actually begin to think that they to actually waver in their faith and their identity. That is why they speak very highly of it. Because in persecution, just like Jesus who went through persecution, it says in Hebrews 12 that he went through the shedding of blood. Go and read it in Hebrews 12. It says that you have no excuse to not have discipline in your faith and your identity because you have not shed blood like Jesus. Jesus had to shed blood. Jesus, was, Jesus, Jesus shed blood on the cross and throughout shedding blood still maintain his discipline as the Holy Spirit. And it says in Hebrews 12, listen to what I'm telling you. It says in Hebrews 12 that if he could shed blood and be nailed to a cross and keep strict discipline of his identity as the Holy Spirit, you have no excuse because you're not shedding blood. If you're following what I'm saying, type the cross. It says that very clearly in Hebrews 12. And it also says in Hebrews 12 that the Father is disciplining you to share in his holiness. Go and read it in Hebrews 12. He's disciplining you to share in his holiness. Do you know that holiness is a parallel to power in the Old Testament? In other words, when you read that, it should read, Father is disciplining you to share in his power. <laughs> Priscilla, is this answering your question? My dear and holy sister, is this... Is this answering everybody's question? And you want to know, you're probably asking, okay, so where in scripture directly shows that we are the spirit of God? I'll give you two. <laughs> oh, as a matter of fact, I'll give you three. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. No, Revelation chapter 1. Go with me to Revelation. You've been, so if everybody here has been asking, and probably quest, you have a lot of questions with regards to why these things have not been. If you're looking for the secret, I'm giving it to you very blunt. Very straight. Go to go with me to Revelation chapter one. As a matter of fact, not chapter one. Chapter Chapter 5, verse 6. Right? Revelation 5, 6. Sorry, says I've been getting disciples all weekend. What? <laughs> what are you referring to, Laurie? To be a little more specific. 
Revelation 5, 6. Thank you, Holy Sister, for posting that day. It's always very helpful with regards to, to, to the posting of the scriptures. So Revelation 5, 6 reads, follow me now. Open your Bible and read this. It says, and there between the throne, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, and there between the throne, with the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb, Christ, standing, bearing scars and wounds, as though it had been slain with seven horns, complete power, with seven eyes, complete knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God who have been sent on duty into all the earth. Pay attention. I've been getting disciplined. Oh, <laughs> Yes, actually, I will confirm that for you. The fathers will actually to discipline you because until you begin, his glory basically what is taking place is that you are being disciplined and only when you make the decision to maintain the discipline will, be, will the power flow. Honestly, I'm very, I'm, it, it doesn't get straighter than that. It's a decision that you have to make. Because this is not taught, Christians go through 40 and 50 years of their life not seeing it. And they're actually running, they end up running down money, running down food, and doubting God. And the reason why they're running down the food, and they're running down the money, and they're running down every wind of doctrine, and every person that talks about the power of God is because they have not been taught that the discipline in Christ is a decision that they have to make. So they're, learning, they're spending 30 and 40 years to learn by experience. And some of them actually not reaching to the understanding that this is all about discipline, making a decision to maintain discipline in your identity. And only when that decision is made are you going to see power. You cannot use what you're seeing as a reference point. If you're using what you see as a reference point, you're making the, ref you're making the, man the spiritual manifestation, you're God. If you're making money the reference point to validate you, having food, the reference point to validate that you are son of God, the food is your God, not God. If you're using money as a reference point to validate that you are son of God, and the money is your God, not God. And if you're using, if you're using um, spiritual manifestation, supernatural manifestation as a reference point to, to validate you, or to, to self-approval, as a, as, um, that, that you are son of God, the manifestation is your God, not God. All right? I just need to say that very openly. So if you're actually, any of you actually experiencing this, and I know everyone here, if you have not heard this, you're actually relating to what I'm telling you. You're actually relating to what I'm telling you. Peace out. Thank you for the wisdom. Makes so much awesome. Awesome, holy sister. Be blessed and much and abundant love to you. <clears throat> Are you saying stand firm on the truth and the scriptures? Don't waver. Yes, it's a decision. Yes, Rosemary, it's a decision. So, where in scripture does it identify that the sons of God are the spirits of God? I just showed you the seven spirits of God in, Re in Revelation 5, 6. Now I want you to go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. I'm going to show you Revelation, and I'm going to show you Hebrews, and, I'm, and then I'm going to show you Acts. The book of Acts. Revelation 4, chapter 4, verse 5. Let's read. And it says, From the throne came flashes of lightning, and rumbling sounds, and peals of thunder, seven lamps of fire, 
were burning in front of the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, more, everyone has been taught here is one Holy Spirit, one Spirit, one God, one Spirit of God. Here in Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 actually identifies seven spirits of God. What is the context? What is the context? To find the context for the seven spirits of God, we need to go back a chapter. So go back with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're in chapter 4. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Now notice, it says seven lamps of fire were burning in front of the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven lamps of fire. Go back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And it reads, To the angel, the divine messenger of the church in Sardis, this is Jesus speaking. Now Jesus, listen up. At the end of every letter, Jesus says, He who has, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has, to, what the Spirit says to the churches. Therefore, Jesus, at the end of, let, of the letter, is identifying himself as the Spirit of God talking his entire, mess, his entire letter. So the first thing I want you to take into consideration is, if just as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Then just as Jesus is, in every letter, he's identifying himself as the Spirit of God. You will do well to copy the same person that you are. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1 says, so the same person who is actually identifying himself as the Spirit of God is speaking about seven spirits of God. He says to the angel, the divine messenger, the churches in Sardis right? these are the words of him who has, this, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So now he actually identifies as a couplet. The word and there link seven spirits of God and the seven stars. It means that the seven spirits of God are also seven stars. It's the same thing. So now we know that the seven spirits of God are the seven stars. What are the seven stars? Let's go back. <clears throat> We're going back now to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. Revelation 2, 1. Turn there quickly. Revelation 2, 1 says, to the angel, the divine messenger of the church in Ephesus, right? These are the words of the one who holds firmly the seven stars, which are the, the angels or messengers of the seven churches in his right hand. We now go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. So we see seven stars and seven spirits. Seven, seven stars and seven spirits of God. And the seven, in the Quaker chapter, it actually says the seven stars, which are the seven angels of the seven churches. Go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and it reads, As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Do you know that the angels of the seven churches there, the, the word that is actually translated, angels of the seven churches, actually means the seven cantors of the synagogues. The cantor in the synagogue is the person that you would stand up in the synagogue and lead the song in the synagogue. Jesus is calling the cantor. In our Western culture, we would call that person the pastor. Right there in scripture, it actually says, Jesus is actually calling the persons that he is speaking to. He is writing a letter to the, to, the, to, the, to the seven leaders of the churches or the seven cantors of the synagogues because these are Jewish Christians he's referring to. That's why he's mentioned a synagogue and so on. Seven, the seven spirits of God are the seven stars of God and the seven stars of God are the seven angels of God who are the seven cantors. Jesus himself is calling you, calling the persons he's speaking to, spirits of God. He is seen it very blatantly. He calls them the spirits of God that are on duty on the earth. Jesus also identifies himself as the spirit of God. 
Where else the scripture is that present? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. So I hope this is actually helpful to you. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go, let's scroll down. And it says, Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 7. Reading from verse 7 to verse. I read from verse 7, and it says, You must submit to correction for the purpose of discipline. God is dealing with you as with son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and with all discipline, in which all God's children share, then you are illegitimate children and not sons at all. Notice to what he says in it. There's a lack of discipline in your identity that is actually, he says that if Father does not discipline you, then he does not love you. Father loves you, and he, what he's trying to do is to actually discipline you. See, these things are not taught. So the church actually went around bouncing their heads like headless chickens, walking into pillars. And they live in 30 and 40 years and not getting anywhere. So he says, you are legitimate sons by being disciplined because what Father is doing is that he needs you to be disciplined in your identity to manifest the power and the holiness of your identity. If not, you actually will have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you're still holding on to the identity called Cheryl, the identity called Sherry, the identity called Priscilla, and no power is flowing. And you're praying, and you're praying, and you're praying, because you're not praying from your identity, which comes from your spirit. You're praying from the old identity, from the old spirit, and the old spirit is not there anymore, so there's no energy coming from that identity. That is just a memory. That old spirit is not there anymore. So the battery for that spirit, gone. There's Holy Spirit here now. And if and if is the if the spirit of the horse is what caused the animal to be called a horse, and the spirit of a dog is what caused the animal to be called a dog, you having the spirit of God is what calls you, makes you identify yourself as God, as Holy Spirit. Read on. We read in verse 9, Moreover, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we submitted and respected them for training us. Shall we not much more willingly submit to the Father of spirits? Which spirit are you talking about? The spirits of God. Have you not have... Um, shall we not much more willingly submit to the Father of Spirits. And it goes on to say, verse 10. Sorry. Um, let's read verse 9 again. Moreover, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we submitted and respected them for training us. Shall we not much more willingly submit to the Father of Spirits and live by learning from his discipline? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for only a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us, but he, Father God, disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. Listen to me very carefully. You have been made into the Holy Spirit. And the only way for you to manifest is the holiness of your spirit which is the power of the Spirit, is for you to be disciplined as the Spirit. In other words, if you get the Spirit of a horse, you need to discipline yourself to live like a horse so that the Spirit of the horse can flow so you can get strong like a horse. 
you can actually begin to function in the power of a horse. Now you have the spirit of holiness. It takes discipline for you to live in your identity as the spirit of holiness, for the holiness to manifest. <clears throat> you want another example? Ananias and Sapphira. When Peter spoke to Ananias and Sapphira, who did, did not Peter ask them if they stole the money? Pay attention. And they said, sorry, let me stole the money. <laughs> they stole the land for a particular for, for, for a particular um, for a particular price. Peter asked them that. The writer of the book of Acts is Luke, the same Luke that wrote the gospel of Luke. So Luke is writing and he says, Peter asked Ananias and Sapphira if they sold the land for this amount. They said, no. Sorry, they said, yes, we sold it for this amount. What was next? What is Peter's next question? Peter's next question is, why does Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Who asked the question? Peter was the one that asked, did you sell the land for this price? When they lied, Peter says, why has Satan put it in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Who asked the question? Peter. And if they lied, so the question that Peter asked, then Peter is identifying himself as the Holy Spirit of God. Is this making sense? This information, everything I've been, I'm explain, what I'm explaining here is explaining in more detail and with more scriptural backing in the book called You Are Elohim. So for those of you who ordered it, that information is going to be in your hands. If you're following this, type Holy Spirit. So what's hindering you? The decision to be disciplined in your identity. What's hindering you is that you're using everything else to validate you except your identity. That is what's hindering you. Stop it. <laughs> you don't need to go through the, the labor and the experience that I went through. You can simply make a decision to not go through that and just see the manifestation. Let go of your old identity. Listen very carefully to what I'm telling you again. Let go of the old identity. This is nothing that you have to change. Nothing that you have to work on. This is a massive misunderstanding that's going on in the body of Christ. There's nothing for you to change. Let me tell you something. An agreement with God is an agreement. If you make a business agreement with another business, when you make the agreement, the conditions are established. You do not make an agreement with another business, not, make the, not meet the requirements of the agreement or the conditions of the agreement and then tell them you're working on it. You know what will happen to you? The, the agreement will be cut and you'll be facing a dread, a, a dread lawsuit because you are not meeting your conditions. Identifying yourself with the Holy Spirit is nothing that you work on. It's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement that you make with Father when you identify yourself, when you, act, when you believe in Jesus as your Lord. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord, the condition to walk in the covenant is to identify yourself with Christ Jesus. This is not something that you work on. You do not have to work on your behaviors. All you need to do is to meet the condition of the agreement, which is identify yourself as the Holy Spirit, which is identifying yourself as Christ Jesus. And the Spirit of God helps you pull all of your behaviors in line. Where is it written in the scripture that you need to be working upon this and working upon that? It does not work like that. Be faithful to your agreement to identify yourself as the Holy Spirit and the power will flow to correct your behaviors. 
I'm speaking this from four years of experience. Never once have I actually tried to fix a behavior. The moment that I try to, to fix a behavior, that right there is me identifying myself independent of the Holy Spirit. Think about what I'm telling you. <laughs> there is no mathematics behind that. Identify yourself with the Holy Spirit. Priscilla, I hope this answers your question. So what I was telling you is, don't take my word for it. If you're dealing with your children, you're dealing with issues at home, deal with it as the Holy Spirit. Identify yourself with the Holy Spirit. Use the Holy Spirit as your reference point and deal with it. And you'll realize that the power will flow. You will have, you'll begin to have peace. And the power will flow. And intelligence will flow to solve the issues with your children. I'm telling you this by four years of experience. This, this works. It is the, what the scripture says is true. It is what the scripture says. I am living proof of that. <laughs> Him and I are one. Yes, Rosemary. Even when you're praying, how did Jesus pray? In John 17, he says, Father, we, we are, we are, let us, you are Elohim. Elohim doesn't say, Father, help me, grant me this. Elohim doesn't say that. Nowhere in the Bible does Elohim talk like that. Elohim says, Father, let us, let us get a vehicle. Let us purchase a new house. Jesus actually said in, in John 17, Father, just as Jesus is, so are you in this world. Jesus actually said in John 17, Father, what is yours? What is mine is yours. And what is yours is mine. Why are you asking God to give you something that he's already given to you as Jesus? He's given to you as the Holy Spirit. Think about what you're doing. Instead of asking, you should be saying, Father, let us get this. Because what is yours is his and what is his is yours. Is this making sense? Are you all getting anything out of this? I'm answering your question. Tonight is probably the most blunt night that I have done in life. <laughs> right? Which means that if you identify yourself as the Holy Spirit, then you are now the soul of God. You're the body of Christ, and a spirit mixed with dust equals a soul. Therefore, you are the soul of God. To identify yourself with the Holy Spirit, to identify yourself with Jesus. There is no flesh in you. There is, you have to stop, this, stop that nonsensical approach of saying Satan attacking you and looking for attacks. It is because you actually... Hey, let me, let me end with this. Let me end with this, with, this, with this note right here. What is a relationship? It's because of this lack of understanding here that even general relationships mash up. But once you understand this, you'll understand why you need to stop thinking about Satan attacking you. <laughs> right? What is a relationship? By definition, in the dictionary, a relationship is a connection. Do you know that a connection between two persons is in fact an awareness of those two persons, of each other? It is an awareness. In other words, if I am not aware of Cheryl and Cheryl is not aware of me, we do not have a relationship. What causes a connection between us is that we are aware of each other. Which means that if, for example, Chris was in a room with me and I choose to ignore Chris, we do not have a connection. We do not have a relationship. For me to benefit from Chris's presence in the room, I need to be aware of him. Our relationship is an awareness. That's how long distance relationships work. An awareness of each other in different parts of the world functions as if 
a person is right next to each other. Being next to each other is being aware of each other. Is this making sense? If our, if our relationship was an awareness, the whole Christian religious arena is in hell. You know why? Because they have more of a relationship with Satan because they are aware of him more than they have a relationship with God. And because they are aware of Satan, there's all kind of nonsense going on with them. They have a more intimate relationship with Satan because they are more aware of demons and being attacked by the devil. And the devil wants to do them this. And the devil wants to do them that. And the devil doing this. And the devil distracting them. And the devil giving them a temptation. You're supposed to have a relationship with God. Your relationship with God means that you're supposed to be aware of God and God alone. What the devil do is none of your business. You ask for being blunt and I'm being very blunt. <laughs> the faster you come to these revelations, if, to these understandings and acceptance, the faster you're walking the kingdom of God. And I want you to walk in the kingdom of God. Which means the reason why you have demonic attacks and sickness and, the, and things going on in your home and all of this nonsense is because you and Satan is partners. Satan is your God. God is not your God. You're making Satan your God. And how are you making him how you making Satan your God? Because you are aware of him. When you want to kill a relationship, what do you do? You separate from the person and you be and some people actually go so far as to going to meet other persons. You know what they're doing? They're trying to kill the awareness of the person. And when they actually filter themselves of the awareness of the person, they can see that they have gotten over the person. Once they are aware, the, really, the connection continues. Why are you living in awareness of Satan and demons? You actually have, you are actually building a relationship with Satan and the demonic realm. Is this making sense? Satan doing this and Satan doing that. The whole religious church, watch them. They, they're taking licks because they, are, they have a relationship with Satan. Is this the right thinking? Yes, Rosemary. It's not only thanking him, but being aware of his presence. Let me tell you something. If you... This does I tell you, demons don't be in my home. Demons are not in my house. Where I live doesn't have demons in my room. <laughs> I used to go through that in Pentecostalism. I was so aware of Satan that I said, no, I'm thinking about how I'm supposed to live. So not open doors. A bunch of nonsense. A bunch of nonsense. Just because of my awareness of the devil, the blame devil in my room, attacking me on our bed, going through all kind of negative experiences because I am very aware of their presence and the doorways I could open. One set of crap. The moment I understood that the promises said, Leviticus 26 says, that God's promise that if you actually fulfill the commandment, which I am in fulfillment of, by the way, because Romans 8 says that the righteous and just requirements are fulfilled in me. Because Christ has become me. I am now, I am now Christ Jesus. I am now the Spirit of God. Listen to what I'm telling you. When I realized that in Leviticus 26 says that because when the, the, the righteous person, the person who is fulfilling the law, who keeps the commandments, the promise is that God will dwell among you. And he will walk among you. When I began to apply that in my personal life, that I am aware of the presence of God in my bedroom right now. I am aware of him. I am aware that he is walking in my pathway. 
is working in my kitchen. It's four years now. The revelation of that actually came at the beginning of this year. Understanding it and applying it. And it's no this since last year. Last year. The middle of last year, or early last year, was around April, May last year, I came to that revelation. And by applying this, listen to me. I live, this is actually now two years, or year and a half, so two years. And I do not have demons in my room. I don't have demons in my home. I don't have demons in my property. I do not have encounters with devils. What actually giving you the encounters is your awareness of the devil. You actually, by your awareness, building an intimate relationship with Satan and demons. You want to know how to stop it? Build an awareness of God and forget the de forget Satan. Listen to me. <laughs> oh God, yes, Cheryl, exactly. Exactly. Peter said to discipline the procreative force of your mind. Bro, what John Crowder says is very straight. And I'm telling you that by experience. The gospel works. The religion does not. <laughs> the religion does not. So, just, let me tell you something. God, Jesus, does not, listen to me, whatever you acknowledge, listen to me and write this down, you know, whatever you acknowledge as having the ability to affect you, you have just made it your authority. You've just made it higher than you. Good God, I hope that you're grasping what I'm telling you, you know. What, touch me, you are said in the scriptures to be equal with God. Jesus said that. The Jews understood this. That's why they said that when Jesus was identifying himself as the Son of God, they understood. It was a cultural understanding that the person that says he's the Son of God is actually saying that he is God and that he is equal to God. Which means that your equality with God means that God is not even more powerful than you. If your mind religious, that statement troubling your brain right now. Because if God has made him, made you equal with him, a multiplication of him, and just as Jesus is, so are you in this world. Jesus is not more powerful than you. Father is not more powerful than you. You are equally powerful to them. They are not more powerful than you, and you are not more powerful than them. You're like, we are all equal power. Therefore, whatever you acknowledge as being able to affect you, you have just made it more powerful than you. Do you realize that when you are aware of Satan and aware of demons, and you're seeing and you and you and you and you are you are in conscious awareness that you're looking for the attack of Satan, and Satan wants to do this. What you are seeing is that Satan is God over God. That Satan is Jesus' is God. And Jesus is less powerful than Satan. Think about what you're doing and what you're saying. That lies from the pit of hell. Jesus even took it a step further exactly saying that we will do even greater things. So you want to know the secret to stop experiencing demonic things? Stop your awareness of Satan. Chop off that relationship. That intimacy that you want to be building with him, kill it. Kill it real dead. As we say here in Trinidad. 
kill it. Does this make sense? Yes, Rosemary, equal power. I should say that again. What I'm saying, what I just said was, whatever you acknowledge as being able to affect you, like you're looking out for demonic attacks, you're, you're, you're vigilant, that it open a door to Satan, or Satan, the, 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 the temptation. In Christ, you shouldn't even be tempted. You should not even be aware of a temptation. Because you are righteousness conscious. You are righteous conscious. Righteousness is not tempted. What is tempted is your own knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> you see how you you see how people you see how the Christian body is actually causing their own problem? They're causing it all on their own. Because the religion teaches doctrines that are satanic. And I see it as I said it earlier on. To be religious is the same thing as being a member of the Church of Satan. You're not different. I want to say that very clearly. Let it go. Let go of that religious approach. It has nothing to do with God. Nothing at all. All them rules. And you have to do this, and you can't do this, and you have to do this, and you can't do this, and, and you have to do this, or else you open that door. You know where that comes from? Hell. Eliminate it from your life. Eliminate it from your life. Yes, Rosemary, we are righteous. Yes, beloved sister, kill that relationship. It's very simple. It's very simple. Make your identity strict Holy Spirit and kill that relationship. Make the presence of God around you Holy Spirit. Be, and also follow the leadings of the Spirit. If you're getting a sense in, of something that is evil, just tell it, just destroy the speed destruction tip and tell it to leave. You are greater light than any other light outside here, which means in the spiritual realm, if you tell an angel, bow, he has to bow, much less a demon, think about what I'm telling you. If the angels worship Jesus, the angels worship in you too. And if you tell the strongest angel in the kingdom, bow, that is exactly what he has to do because your light is greater than his light. Much less a demon spirit. You can you could breathe hard and the demon will, the demon will, will, will have to move because that has no light. Light is authority. You have the greatest light and demons have no light. They're all darkness. What do you think that means? This is another point. Scientifically, darkness only exists in the, in, the, in the absence of light. How is it that you say that you are a light, a sun, an S-U-N, and you think demons running upon you? How does that work? <laughs> How does that work? For you to say that demons run up on you is to say that you are a Satan. Come now, man. Second Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians 6. For you to say that you are actually experiencing demonic attacks is to say that you are a Satan. Because darkness does not exist in any presence of light. I could take this in a million angles. <laughs> just to show you that all of those concepts that you've had in your mind there's a reason why I spoke blatantly tonight and I had to speak blatantly because if I don't speak blatantly I'm actually encouraging the concept in your brain and sometimes blatant speech is what is needed to rub against your belief system 
and you might get angry, you might be a little uptight and irritated that are speaking so, so brashly against it. But guess what? If that is what is necessary for you, to, for you to actually wake up, shake off the religious foolishness and step into Christ. Making sense? That is what you need to shake it off drastically, cut it off. Burn that, burn down that house and move forward in truth. So hear what? You come into the gospel. To believe in Jesus means that you identify yourself with Jesus, which means to say you are the Holy Spirit. Keep your agreement with God. Don't tell God you're trying. God didn't ask you to try anything. God asks you to be the Holy Spirit, to identify yourself by your spirit, and to use your Holy, the Holy Spirit as your reference point, as your, as your, as your identity. I guarantee you that you all will actually begin to, 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 to apply these things. And you're going, to, you're going to come back and tell me that there's, there's a dramatic change. There's a dramatic change. But remember, as I started this entire life, all of this, everything in the kingdom of God comes from reference point. And your validation of your existence, the validation of your greatness, the validation of your security is the Holy Spirit. If you're actually seeking self-validation from others and self-approval from others, you are everything that I speak in this that I've spoken to in this live tonight, forget it and delete it. It is of no use to you. Does this make sense? Yes, Cheryl, start talking it blatantly. Say it out loud. I am the Holy Spirit. If Jesus could call his brothers, the persons who, he, who run in the, 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 the synagogues, the, the seven spirits of God, what is holding you back from standing up in the mirror and saying, I am the Holy Spirit of God. I am holy. You know what actually saint means? A holy one. For you to be holy, you need the Holy Spirit. The spirit of holiness to say that you're holy. So it's all right for you to say a saint, but it's not all right to say you're the spirit of God, that you're the Holy Spirit, that you are a, a holy one, a holy man of God, a holy woman of God, a son of God, which is a Holy Spirit, father of Holy Spirit, one Holy Spirit of Christ Jesus. You know what's stopping you? The religious mumbo jumbo. <laughs> The religious mumbo jumbo is what is pulling your back. Yeah? So, I think it's about time you let it go and you hold on to what you agreed to. And you agreed when you believed in Jesus, you agreed to identify yourself with Jesus. It's about time that you let go. Of all of the reasons you're trying and just follow your agreements. If you do not actually try to keep the conditions of agreements when you actually make an agreement with a company, don't do that with God. It's a decision. It is not something that you work at. It's a decision. Right? So hold on to your identity in Christ and remember fear of man, respect of other people's opinion of you is going to keep you in hell. You are in idolatry. I say again, respect and fear for other people's opinion of you is idolatry. You are actually establishing another God 
the only person that you should be considering the opinion of you as important is Father God and Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit. Right? So, I hope that this um, is actually good to be myself on camera. Eh? That's blatant, straight talk. No mixing it up. Straight on, blatant talk. It's actually good. And I say that because if there's one thing that I have learned in my walk in Christ, is that to get rid of darkness, you have to see it for what it is. Society, the church, the church culture, the denominational culture, and society has taught everyone that darkness should always have that you, that um it is okay to compromise and to keep and to keep a little darkness. It is okay to allow a little darkness. It is because of that mindset that women are battered by by by, by men. In, in, in marriages, compromise. And when the darkness is around, they teach you by the denominational culture as well as societal culture. They teach you to take some white paint and to paint the darkness so you can live with it. And what you don't realize is that one speck of darkness in the spirit realm is equivalent to a universe of darkness, to the entire universe of darkness. So to identify darkness, to actually eliminate darkness from your life, you need to watch that darkness very blatantly, very bluntly, and identify for what it is. If it's darkness is darkness, treat the smallest darkness to the biggest darkness with the same level of indignation. Because compromise is the destruction of your identity. I say again, compromise is the destruction of your identity. When you compromise, you're actually destroying your convictions because what you're doing is making an excuse to not follow your conviction. That right there is the beginning of the destruction of your identity because your identity is actually the pillars or the cornerstones of your identity are your convictions. So if you compromise, forget this. Forget Christ. Forget walking in Christ. Watch our darkness for what it is and eliminate it. If I could do it, you could do it. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, the black and white approach to faith and trust in God has cost me relationships, even family relationships, because they live with compromise. But for me to function in power, I cannot compromise, because that compromise is beginning to destroy my identity as the Holy Spirit. And all the power flows from my identity as the Holy Spirit. Right? So I encourage you, holy sisters and brothers, Make the decision. It's just a decision away. And a decision with drastic action against the darkness. Drastic action. All right? So, it is now 4.04 a.m. in Trinidad to You know how when we... I, I, I love always, as I said, I love actually sitting down and actually going through these things with you all. And um, I intended to do the Let's Talk session sometime in the near future. And I am most happy. I am happy. Most delighted to see that you all actually show that interest and, and that desire to actually have that this kind of conversation tonight. So I hope that this is
this, this was this was awesome. Thank you so much for the brother Zayn. This this has helped me so much. I'm glad that I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. I just broke up an unhealthy relationship today. Bye bye, Sita. Love you. <laughs> yeah. Cheryl, all unhealthy relationships exist because we have been trained by society as well as denominational culture to compromise. And compromise is actually painting the darkness with a white paint to say that you can live with it. The church has taught compromise in a professional manner. And hear how, hear, how, hear, how, hear how it is done. You are taught to love as a rule. And hear how this actually works against you as a believer. Working with love as a rule means that when you feel here inside of you that the Holy Spirit is saying, that person is evil, is wicked. Separate yourself from it. The church teaches you love is a rule. So you know what you begin to do? Because love is a rule, you disobey, disregard, and ignore the voice of the conscience of the spirit, the intuition, your discernment. And you say, I have to love him. That's what you do. That's what they teach. You say, I have to love him. I have to love her. I think, I think you beat the, beat the tree a lot. Hey, Sarah says, I remember you see what they done. Awesome. Awesome. But I'm actually saying that actually keep unhealthy relationships in your life is also having relationships with Satan. It's very straight. I'm being very blunt. You're actually having relationships with Satan. And I'm not saying that people don't deserve to be to have kindness. But people who actually are opinionated and 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 arrogant and lord their emotions over you a relationship is supposed to be a mutual exchange very mutual and when you're in relationships where people are actually lording their emotions and the emotional importance over you you are really you are in a relationship with a satan by scriptural standards and many people stay in the relationships and suffer all because they have been taught. Everybody does make mistakes. I ain't saying no. Everybody will make mistakes. But there's a massive difference between somebody who is making errors and somebody who is blatantly arrogant and lauding their emotional importance and their self-importance over you. The Bible calls those people the wicked. It calls them the wicked. Many women stay in marriages and get licks. You know why? Because the church teaches them they have to love the man. While the Holy Spirit tells them, separate, get away from that evil and that darkness. But they had to love him and they had to forgive him. And they actually teach that forgiveness and trustworthiness is the same thing, which is not the same. But forgiveness is, re is releasing displeasure. I've said it before. Trustworthiness is something that you build by consistent, by consistent regard for the person. You build trustworthiness. So when you're actually in a relationship and there's a breaking of the trustworthiness, forgiving the person does not mean that you entrust yourself into that person's hand. Just like that. Even Jesus John chapter 2 says that he, it said that Jesus didn't entrust himself to men because he understood their nature. He understood the, the kind of heart that they had. A 
And because of these compromises with regards to not standing up for what you think, you sh what, what is the principle, what is right, the principle of mutuality, the principle of emotional regard, the principle of respect, of dignity. You're looking for excuses. You're suffering. Do you know that King Solomon, I'm paraphrasing here, said in the book of Proverbs that a man suffers as long as he desires to suffer? You suffer as long as you hold on to your compromise. I say again, you suffer as long as you decide to hold on to your compromise. This applies to healing. You suffer as long as you desire to hold on to the compromise of not identifying yourself with the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. It's, you suffer as long as you hold on to the compromise of identifying, of, of uh, holding on to an awareness of everything else but God. Because when you came into Christ, your your agreement was to identify yourself with the Holy Spirit and identify yourself with God and the presence of God all around you. Your suffering is as long as you want. Your suffering is as long as you hold on to your compromise. When you choose to let go of your compromise, your suffering stops. You are controlling your suffering in relationships, in the spiritual realm, in, in marriage, in business, in friendships, everything. A slave is not a slave by force. A slave has to surrender his mind to his master. Does that make sense? That's, I hope that all of this has actually been helpful. And beloved sister Cheryl, I, th I, I, I thank God that this has actually been helpful. And helpful to not only to you, Holy Sister, but to Chris, to Rosemary, to everybody who will actually be watching this. I know that many people may, may watch this and not be very pleased with my blatant speech. But... If there's one thing that I've learned is to walk in the kingdom, you need to be very black and white. And don't ever play with the black. Not even in the smallest spot, in the smallest speckle. All right, so let me, it's actually now 12 past four. So Father, in the presence of the Lord Jesus, in whom we all are and in, all, in whom we stand, I thank you for each and every one of you. I thank you for each and every one of your son. You in each and every one of the persons viewing this and will be viewing this. And everyone who has viewed this. Every knowledge that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ in every saint here. Cheryl, Rosemary, Chris, Sherry, Priscilla, everyone on this live and everyone who will be watching will be watching the, the, the recording in the presence of the Lord Jesus. All knowledge that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. All the religiosity. I curse it. I decree destruction to it. It shall no longer exist. The awareness of Satan that they live with. Curse it be now banished. You all are blessed. You all are Elohim. You are one Holy Spirit of Christ Jesus. You are the Spirit of God. Stand. Stand in light and intelligence. Stand in power. And be whom Father has said you will be and you are. And so Father, their minds, their brains be not renewed, the knowledge. We have just proven all of their religious influence knowledge wrong. Be destroyed in the presence of the Lord Jesus.
be destroyed all knowledge of of God and all consciousness of Satan of the demonic realm be now severed from your consciousness and be blessed you are blessed walking blessings in the presence of the Lord Jesus and give them all Father intelligence and the ability to actually identify reference points adequately so that the power of God they will share we will share in your holiness we will share in your power in the presence of the Lord Jesus so be it amen and amen all right well that brings us to the end of our live session I must agree with my holy brother Chris I think I've bypassed the three hour mark and I've gone into almost five. <laughs> oh Lord! Hey. But it's time well spent. It's time well spent and I appreciate each and every one of you and your time actually sitting down this and discussing scripture and principles of the kingdom with me. And I, I trust that this all of the information here has been useful. I encourage you all to actually review as well as very soon I'm actually the next I'm going to take the sessions that we did today and I'm going to do watch parties with it just as I did tonight with regards to the identity but the watch parties I'm actually going to break it up into one hour a watch party but these sessions are three hours and two so you can do a watch party of an hour two hours and then pause and continue the watch party and so on all right and for those of you who will actually be watching this i just want to remind you that you can actually connect with um you can actually connect with me via my my my, my facebook page at zane in fuego no with numeral one at the fuego numeral one um, zanepa.woodpress.com z-a-n-e-p-i-w-r-e.woodpress.com um, and also check out my books on my web, on, on my on my Facebook page on my web page you can actually go to zanepa.woodpress.com look for get your books and check out you are Elohim right um, also the Ephesian study book the colored version as I said you'll see for $76 but you can also get the black and white version for for thirty nine ninety nine, this is your Elohim thirty nine ninety nine. Right, you can also check other tabs on my page where you can actually purchase items where we where we actually desire to reintroduce the intelligence of the Spirit of God into clothing and accessories. Cheryl, my beloved and holy sister, thank you for all of the love that you have actually been showing by the heart throughout this video. It's 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 very heartwarmingly acknowledged. Much an abundant love to you, Holy Sister, and much an abundant love to each and every one of you here. Sherry, who has actually been also sending love. Chris, everyone here, much love, much an abundant love to you. All right, check out um those books. Also, on my web page, you have also free PDFs. Two, we have two workbooks. It's actually two out of twelve. Then there are actually ten other workbooks on the way that we are working on. So feel free to go to the inpray.wordpress.com, click on Get Your Tabs, and scroll down to the bottom to the bottom of the page, and you will actually see the PDFs ready there for download. So just click on it, and you'll be able to download it from my Google Drive. All right? These works, these these books, these uh, those work, those workbooks in particular are to designed for personal study, group study, both formally as well as informally. These workbooks are designed to walk you from where you are, wherever you are. And if you have not experienced a tangible relationship and tangible power of God, these works these workbooks are designed to walk you into it step by step, baby steps. So the information is given. It is not a book the, the workbooks are not books so don't it is not to be read like a, like a like some storybook it is actually a manual a workbook so the information is presented you are you are 
for, for you to actually research the, the, these verses that is actually that actually provided. Take notes, answer questions, and you have practical activities to engage to be able to actually walk into the power of God. Right? This is very real. Right? The UI Elohim is also a study manual, which is actually not a written like a novel, like a book, a study manual, which actually provides you all of the scripts, um, a lot of scripture references for you to study, as well as practical activities, practical engagement. Right? So by studying the, the, the UI Elohim manual, you are actually going to settle into your identity as Elohim, and the exercises will actually help you with regards to functioning from the perspective of Elohim. Yeah. Uh, also, you can also get the Holy Religious Mindset, which is actually a book that was written last year that represents 12 topics. The oh, Holy Religious Mindset workbooks are actually the 12 chapters. So if you don't want to get the book, you can actually use the workbooks. All right, those workbooks are free. And if you want to purchase professional versions of those workbooks, you can actually go to the web page, my, my, my web page, and click on the images. And it will actually take you to, to actually to purchase those books at Amazon.com. Right? So show some, show some, um, show some, show some love and show some, and, and, and please feel free if you would like to, if you would like to, um, to, to contribute, um, you would like to donate or to, or to support us, you can actually purchase the books, you can purchase the clothing and accessories. Um, also, if you would like to donate us directly, or to, yeah, to donate to, to, to me or to, 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 do, to donate well, with us directly, just get in contact with us. Yeah, all of the, all of the, um, all of the finances are generated from these books as well as the clothing and accessories and so on to actually use to help us to put out more material. Right? That's where that's actually how we actually be able to put out all of these books, workbooks and so on. Alright, so um and also on my webpage on the on the get your books tab on my webpage in Pillarwoodpress.com you'll actually see Tony Myers's books on demonstration there. I encourage you to actually purchase his books. His books are actually excellent material and very, 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 very simple down to it. No theological, no theological gymnastics. It's very straight and very down to it. Right? Tony Myers is actually healed from being paralyzed and he's actually been able to walk with him into the reality of healing. Right? Another brother in Christ that actually walks in power and Get, get his books, right? Share the link, share share, share the page, um, and share the links. Yeah, let let get the message of Christ Jesus out to the world. All right. So I love each and every one of you all. Um, also, hey, before I go, also um, I encourage you all to check out Paul Brown. Yeah, he actually. Um, has schools online that if you actually would like to participate in his schools, check out Sonship Lifestyle. And he also has actually released his own books. So check it out. His message is authentic. Right? It's, it's authentic message with regards to uh, who you are in Christ and actually seeing things from God's perspective. Yeah? Check him out and support him. By checking his by, 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 by also purchasing his books. All right? Um, did I forget to say anything in particular? Mm, no. All right. Um, tomorrow, actually, I'm actually the same watch party that we did with the basic identity session. Yeah, I will actually be doing, I hope to be doing on my page once I can sort out the madness with all the new features with, 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 with on, on video. Once I can sort that out, I'll actually be running. Uh, live tomorrow at 9 p.m. AST, which would be 5 p.m. PST. Right. So if you wish to actually do another watch party tomorrow with Basic Identity, feel free to join me on my on my on my on my Facebook page. 
right? So, much love. I love each and every one of you. Cheryl, my beloved and holy sister, your your love, your your the demonstration of your of of your love by all of the hearts by showing your love. All of these hearts is actually, as I said, heartwarmingly, heartwarmingly acknowledged. Much and an abundant love and your family. All right, and everyone on this call, Sherry, much love to you, holy sister. Chris, bro, much love. <laughs> All right. Um, and if you do have questions on, on these things, please feel free to get in contact with me. All right. As if I will, if I don't respond to you immediately, trust me, I will respond to you as soon as it's possible. All right. I am. I really do care and desire to see each and of you walk in the kingdom and I would really like I would really prefer that you don't actually spend time experiencing things that we may have experienced already and if you have inf or you want information we are, we are here so please feel free to message All right so much and abundant love to you we will see each other soon yeah we will have a let another let's talk session soon so Jesus you watch me you've been baptized and to be baptized is to be christened and to be baptized and to christen means to be given a, a different name to be given a new name so you've been baptized into Christ Jesus you've been given the name Christ Jesus if you read Revelation 22 it says that his name is across your forehead his name is holy the holy one <laughs> All right, his name is across your forehead. It's written on your forehead in the spirit realm. All right, so sons of righteousness, S U N S, who are S O N S, sons of righteousness, arise. And and Cheryl and uh, beloved and holy sister Cheryl, com uh, commendations on your aggression and your drastic approach to shutting down the relationship with Satan. I guarantee you, the kingdom will be your experience once you do that. All right? So, we see each other soon, guys. Much love, much and abundant love. Jesus. All the way. All the way. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see. Then let's hope this doesn't stick. <laughs>